and welcome everyone to Disrupt Ed TV, where every little idea could make a big difference in your classroom or your school. And our guest today, Joe, are Troy Hutchings of the Educational Testing Service, Princeton, New Jersey, where he conducts research on the subject of educator ethics. Mm -hmm. And we also have Phil Rogers, who is the executive director, uh, let me make sure I get this right, National Association of State Directors of Teacher Education and Certification, NASDAQ. Uh, welcome to the program, both of you. And uh, the big idea today really is an idea about te teacher ethics. What we want to do is have a conversation that is often an uncomfortable conversation, mm -hmm. but it's a conversation that needs to be had. And mm -hmm. Troy, we talked before the program about how we might walk into this, and I know you've got a story to tell. I'll set it up. A uh, new teacher, right. maybe only a couple of years experience, uh, leaves the classroom, walks across the parking lot, gets to their car, and notices that they have a note from a student under their windshield wiper. Mm -hmm. uh, how, does, how does a teacher handle a situation like that? Well, let's, let's take a look at this. this. This situation actually occurred to me, and it okay. was the notion of going out to my car and, and thinking that uh, I have a note or I have a ticket or something, and when I looked at it, it was clearly a love note, and it was a love note from a student, a female student. Mm -hmm. And at that point, um, a lot of things go through one's mind, but uh, if I go to my principal and show it to my principal, well, my principal might start a shadow file on me, mm -hmm. uh, anticipate, anticipating that I might be grooming a student. Um, I, do I go to the student? Do I talk to other teachers um, about this situation? And, and in those situations, it's very, it's very difficult because if I talk to other teachers, imagine the conversations that might happen around the school. So if I'm working with the student, tutoring her after school, and another teacher walks by and they see us together, could that start a conversation about something um, that is inappropriate happening? So it, it, puts, it puts a teacher in a very awkward situation, mm -hmm. for sure. And, and there are no clear guidelines in something like that. So right. it's not like you can um, follow a school policy or a law or any kind of a statutory language, but it has to be, it has to be a discussion that needs to be had. You know, in, in other professions, um, there's the notion that, especially in the, in the mental health professions, there's this notion that when you work with clients for a, a certain amount of time, they will transfer their emotions onto you. Mm -hmm. And so the goal is to, to train counselors and psychologists in, in not counter-transferring the emotions. So why can't we take that same concept and think about that in schools? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, this isn't unusual, perhaps, for a, a, a student to, to view a teacher in a way other than just um, being a teacher or a student under someone's tutelage, mm -hmm. but rather view them in another role and, and in which they're not, um, they haven't been prepared to, to prepare for. And so in that notion, we should really think about how as a profession, how do we respond to students in these myriad ways, even in these uncomfortable exchanges and situations? Sure. I yeah. mean, it begs a larger question too, in my mind, and that, that is that uh, the real problem is that a, a teacher typically isn't prepared for this. Absolutely not. So, so, uh, so they end up having to freelance their way through what could be an uncomfortable situation, mm -hmm. not knowing where the landmine is. Right. And there are little traps that they need to avoid falling into, and that really right. is why I think it's such uh, a, a great thing to have you both here to talk about this. It's yeah. almost like the student teachers, like peers rather than the student teacher. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, that, that's the interesting thing. I think I think teachers are prepared, especially in the pre-service programs, to and really the the art of pedagogy and, and the science of content. Okay. But what we're not prepared in is necessarily that that notion of the relational capital that we need to build for effective teaching to to take place and effective mm -hmm. learning. But there is a lot of risk in that. So when we talk about relationships and developing relationships that we need to have for students to feel safe and comfortable in the classroom, mm -hmm. there's risk in that. And so we have to, we've never been prepared in that. Mm -hmm. And there poses, there's a lot of vulnerabilities and risk mm -hmm. in working with a vulnerable population mm -hmm. like that. So there are careers at stake here, there are yeah. reputations at stake here, right. and there are, uh, I mean, the stakes really couldn't be higher. And a lot of it just comes down to how do you handle little individual scenario situations like this? Right. Uh, and uh, what, what is it that prevents um, a school principal or uh, a school superintendent from having this conversation before the fact? Why, why don't they talk about it? Well, I, I think there's, there's certainly a, a sense that teachers should just know better. That, okay. that clearly, uh, and, I, and I think this, this harkens all the way back to this notion that um, education has, has often been viewed as an expansion or an extension of, of childcare. Mm -hmm. And if I, as a parent, uh, for example, have never had a code of conduct or a code of ethics in raising my, my children, then why would a teacher need something like that as well? So there's, there's really a, a, a sense of expectation, even 
I want to go all the way back to Horace Mann, who was really one of the original founders of American public education in the mm -hmm. 1840s. He, he really believed that the teaching force should be made up primarily of women because they have a predisposed disposition given to them by their creator mm -hmm. in working with children. So mm -hmm. when we take a look at that, that very core um, um, sentiment, I think that has carried through. And now the fear of even asking another colleague or even going to a supervisor and asking about what I should do in an ethical dilemma infers a lack of ethicality on my part. Mm. Okay. And by not having studying professional ethics, what we rely upon is personal morality. And we have to be really careful with that. Mm. Yeah. So, so, so for the, from the point of view of people who watch our program, they mm -hmm. could be teachers or school sure. administrators or school board members. Um, this is something that really needs to be discussed before the fact, which means mm -hmm. we have to start working through real practical scenarios. What if, what do I do in this case? What do I do in that case? So that we all get to learn how to talk to each other about these things when they come up. Right. Now, yeah. And I think it's important to remember there are 3.3 million teachers in the United States. Mm -hmm. It is the largest profession, bar none, mm -hmm. that, that we have. Okay. And on top of that, it is already the most heavily regulated profession, profession mm -hmm. of all professions. Doctors, nurses, uh, lawyers, none are regulated at the level teachers are. Mm -hmm. But yet at the same time, we find that there is almost an un unwillingness for educators to address the issue of misconduct between themselves, their colleagues, their, their supervisors. They, they, they struggle with how to discuss the struggles, like what Troy was going through as a new teacher mm -hmm. uh, when he found that note. And so one of the things that we know is that the issue of misconduct is not uncommon, but it's not common. Right. Okay. Um, it, as we know, it, it, NASDAQ maintains a national clearinghouse, a national database of, of educators who have had adverse action taken against their certificates. Mm -hmm. That means they have been revoked, they've been suspended, uh, and you don't revoke or suspend someone's certificate unless it's a fairly egregious offense. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the, the, the courts have made it very clear, a certificate is a property right. So they have to have due process, but on any given year, we will have 8,000 records entered into the clearinghouse. That's 8,000 educators who, for one reason or another, some type of egregious offense mm -hmm. resulted in them losing their certificate. Uh, and for many years, we've maintained the, the clearinghouse for many years, uh, for over 25 years, it was only open to state agencies. Hmm. Now it's open to school districts, right. uh, and the reason being because it is not uncommon for an educator to lose their certificate and then go to another <clears throat> state because none of the state's data systems talk to each other. That's interesting. And so now what we've done is with the clearinghouse is allowed the state, say in Nebraska, who has a new teacher showing up from another state to be able to go to the clearinghouse and discover that they lost their certificate in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Before they couldn't do Before that. Before they, they couldn't, couldn't do that. Do that. So now they can, yeah. yeah. And ahead. now we also, uh, in the last year, are allowing school districts to have access. And the reason being, uh, there was a great case uh, this past summer of a coach that was hired by our school district. Uh, he had been in the community for quite a while. He had coached in the community center he had actually been a coach of another sport there in the school. Mm -hmm. And then he was hired to uh, coach the boys' basketball team. Mm -hmm. And what happened was, once he was hired, the school district had brought him on. He didn't have a certificate because he could be hired without a certificate to be a coach. Someone told the school board that he had lost his certificate in New York and North Carolina because mm -hmm. of boundary issues with students. Mm -hmm. okay. Or what we might call an inappropriate relationship with students. Mm -hmm and it turned into a national news story. Right. Had they checked the NASDAQ clearinghouse, they, they would have found his name. Found that. Mm -hmm. We need to take a break, Phil. That was such a great point at which to take a short break. After, this, uh, after these messages, we'll be back with more of Troy Hutchings and Phil Rogers uh, and Disrupt Ed TV. Great, stay aboard. <laughs> Making decisions about the future can be intimidating. Some students have no idea what they'd like to do after high school. Others might have a pretty clear vision, but they might not know how to get there. 
The ASVAB Career Exploration Program combines a multi-aptitude test with an interest inventory and career planning tools to support data-driven decision-making for all young people, regardless of their post-secondary plans, because the same path isn't right for everyone. Our approach centers on understanding what you're good at, your skills, and getting to know yourself, your interests. Then, using that knowledge to explore your options, the ASVAB CEP makes the connection between your skills and interests and the path toward potentially satisfying career options. Gain the confidence to navigate the career planning process. To learn more about the ASVAB CEP and to find out how you can participate, visit www.asvabprogram.com. Uh, welcome back to Disrupt Ed TV. My name is Al Sini. I'm Joe Asimendi. And we're here with Troy Hutchings of ETS and uh, Philip Rogers uh, of NASDAQ. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank, before we continue our conversation, I want to thank Scott Tennant of AJ yes. Gallagher, because mm -hmm. without Scott, we wouldn't have been able to pull these terrific resources together for uh, what is a very important subject. It's very good. grave, very serious topic. And Troy, during the break, I mentioned the Horace Mann quote that you yeah, brought up, yeah. where um, maybe it used to be thought that women are less vulnerable to these problems than men right, are. Right. Well, we know from recent headlines that, in fact, this is a problem that is not gender-specific at all. Right. These, these kinds of things can happen to anybody. And I, I was thinking it's a bad choice that teachers make, but you have a completely different slant on that. It's, uh, well, maybe you could talk about that. Sure. I, I think that the first thing to remember is, is, is really something very basic, and that is that misconduct is not an event, mm -hmm. but rather it's a process. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so the goal is to really examine the process. If we only examine the event, then it only becomes punitive and not preventative. Mm -hmm. And so that's where um, I, I like to kind of, you know, kind of put it into two boxes, if you will. Um, th there is there is this notion of of conduct and laws, and that is kind of this red box. But but most teachers are not in that box, and nor do they cross that line. Mm -hmm. But right to the left of that is this gray box, if you will, filled with the myriad complexities that teachers face. Mm -hmm. And within that, that is the process. So there are all kinds of things that, that might lead a really effective teacher to be right on the edge between the gray and the red, if you will. Mm -hmm. and, and let me give you an example. Sure, um, I, I did a research project several years back where I did a series of interviews with a person that spent five years in prison for an inappropriate relationship with a, uh, with a student. And, mm -hmm. and in, that, in the series of interviews, I, I, it was fascinating to hear about the process because he entered the profession as a very caring person, and that certainly wasn't his goal mm -hmm. um, to, to find himself in a relationship, but it was a student that came to him and said, you're my, my favorite teacher, you're the only one I can talk to, I need to tell you about a situation that's happening in, in my life. Mm -hmm. And of course, being the caring, compassionate person that he is, like most teachers are, mm -hmm. then of course he said, yes, absolutely. Well, that turned into one lunch hour, which turned into another lunch hour, which turned into before school and after school, and not being trained in that expansive role beyond being a teacher, not being trained as a, a, as a counselor or, or understanding the dynamics that, that are at play here, um, he made some critical mistakes. And one of them was being transparent about his own life and, and things that he has gone through. And that changed the relationship. So it became, uh, instead of a teacher-student dyad, it changed that dyad completely. It changed right. into a, a different uh, kind of, yeah, more exactly. of a like peers, Sure, yeah. And, yeah. and it never was about sex at all. No. That's interesting. And in fact, as a 51-year-old teacher and a 14-year-old student, it, that was not even the issue. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, and when we, look at, when we look at misconduct as a process, what it does, it gives us the chance to look in all of the areas and the vulnerabilities and the risks that teachers face every day mm. in their life because they care. And, and my, my thought is that the most caring, compassionate teachers are the ones that are most at risk. Most vulnerable. Right. Yeah, they there. are. Uh -huh. Because uh, the, the teacher that just blows the dust off the transparency mm -hmm. and teaches the same lesson on the same day of the same week, year after year for 30 years, is really not at risk because, mm. but we don't necessarily want those teachers for our children. Mm -hmm. We want the caring, compassionate teachers that um, are really investing into the lives of our children mm. to, uh, to to really allow for the security and, 
and sanctity of, of teaching and learning to come alive. Right? right. Very interesting point because it doesn't have to be sexual. No, well, not at all. It, it, it can right. be a misconception. Right. Any kind of, right. Most any times kind of, it starts out as something totally different. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's exactly. really more interpersonal. And, right. uh, you know, it, it, you mentioned 14 year old. Right. Uh, in this uh -huh. particular mm -hmm. case, I guess it was a 14 year old mm -hmm. student. Is there a particular grade level that we need to be careful about? Well, I, I think. It, it, it depends on the topic. If we're talking mm. teacher sexual misconduct, mm -hmm. uh, clearly that, that would be more probably more middle school than high school. Right. Mm -hmm. But if we're talking about misconduct in general or relationships with students or inappropriate versus appropriate or those kind of things, then certainly that's pre-K all the way through right. 12th grade. All because 12th re grade. remember that, that um, education is an interesting profession. It's a fiduciary profession, mm -hmm. meaning that people come to teachers and they give of, of the society gives of their greatest assets to teachers and unequivocally give them this asset mm -hmm. and didn't doesn't ask any questions we just trust that teachers will handle handle appropriately but within that relationship then there is this power absolutism that exists there mm -hmm. is the fact that educators as practitioners have no social distance between those that they serve and themselves and it's this is constant onslaught of of decisions all day long. One researcher estimates that teachers make 3,000 decisions that are non-trivial over the course of a day. Really? So in the midst of all of that, there's great room for error and mistake. Mm -hmm. right. and, and so to be able to have the conversation, to be able to give ourselves the, the profession permission to have the conversations about, um, uh, about these kind of decisions, how to handle these, these kind of decisions, to actually question each other would be great. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example back to, sure. back to the example of the research project where I, I interviewed um, a, an offender who went to prison. It, it was interesting because when she was coming, the student was coming to him and he felt uncomfortable and not prepared to counsel her, to give her advice. Mm -hmm. So he went to the school counselor and said, this is really your role and he said, no, she is, you're an adult that she trusts, continue in that role. He then goes to the principal and the principal says, to have this adult role model is fantastic. In fact, I, I noticed that she has a study hall at the same time that you have a prep period. Maybe she can be your assistant in the classroom as well. Hmm. All of a sudden, it's actually greasing the slippery right. slope. It actually makes yeah. it worse. Right, it actually makes it worse. Uh -huh. But all of this was not done maliciously. No. no. It was all done out of the ethos of care and compassion. Right. You're trying to be a right. good teacher. And remember, that is that is the role that we expect of our schools and our teachers to to, to have that, that essence of care and compassion. But, but what, what we don't look about the what we don't examine is the risk and, and are we really prepared to handle that? And, and I'm not saying that teachers should not um, care about their students, sure. but rather do we have the tools to kind of leaven those dispositions mm -hmm. that are razor sharp and two-edged, well, you know, and, and do we have the tools to be able to to assist them so they know how to use that most appropriately? Right. And, and the best isn't apparent parents. right away either. Definitely. Right. This, right. It's, it's actually for us an opportune time to be having this kind of conversation mm -hmm. because we have several other guests on our program talking about the importance of gathering student voice. Right. Mm -hmm. And gathering student, hearing what students have on their minds means becoming more actively engaged with the students uh, and more attentive to what they're saying. Right. And the downside of that, the potential slippery slope, is that you're shortening the distance between the teacher and the yeah. student. Yeah. And the closer you get, the more likely you are to slip into this gray area that you mentioned yeah. that could be actionable. And uh, uh, I think I, I, we're coming up on a break. Yeah, but when right. we come back, I think we want to talk a little bit about, I know you've given a lot of expert testimony uh -huh. in cases. Uh -huh. uh, maybe you can tell us maybe one or two of the lessons that we've learned from that. and. Uh -huh. Uh, and then we'll get back to Phil and we'll talk about Great. codes of conduct and codes of ethics. Uh, we'll be right back after this break with more Disrupt Ed TV. Two terrific guests, Phil Rogers and Troy Hutchings. Yeah. Be right back. Our culture is what we believe in and our brand is what we do in our work. When our brand and our culture are in alignment with each other, we become more than just good. We become excellent. Think of this alignment as a mix of flavors in our water cooler. When we gather around and drink it ourselves, we're savoring our culture. When we serve it to our friends and neighbors, we're expressing our brand. So, what's in your water cooler? For groups of all kinds and sizes, our brand and culture alignment toolkit will provide you with a unique water cooler recipe that expresses and makes you the very best at what you do. 
It all starts with a simple, affordable 20-minute online survey. Completely confidential, you can take it whenever suits your schedule. Within two days, you'll receive a BCAT report that expresses your team's signature brand and culture in plain English and includes simple exercises that will help align your team's leaders, stakeholders, and members. They come to Brookdale with a passion for healthcare, cybersecurity, fashion merchandising. They graduate and transfer to universities like Georgetown, NJIT, and the Fashion Institute of Technology. They begin their careers as registered nurses, security engineers, and fashion designers. This is what success looks like. And here is where it all starts. This is Brookdale, college redefined, success reimagined. Take your next step at brookdalecc.edu. Uh, welcome back, everybody, mm -hmm. to Disrupt Ed TV. Uh, my name is Al Sini. I'm still Joe Asamendi. And uh, welcome back, Joe. And it's always a pleasure. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, we love working with each other, but we Thank in particular love talking to guests who really know what they're talking about. Right. And this yeah. is such an important subject to have two great experts mm -hmm. uh, on our program to talk about. During the break, uh, you were talking, I think, to, well, we were talking about expert testimony that you provide in court, Troy, yeah. where often you're called in uh, beyond the point of no return right. uh, to provide testimony. And you mentioned a story, Death yeah. by a Thousand Cuts. Maybe you could recount that mm -hmm. for a while. Sure, ab absolutely. One of, the, one, of the things, one of the things that we have to remember is that um, this is, the, the, misconduct is, again, is a process, it's not an event. Mm -hmm. And in that process, um, it's really kind of a slippery slope, and it, and it starts with a number of things, but one of the things, it's, it's gradual, um, there's always a loss of objectivity, there's a loss of neutrality, which means we become invested into the life of just one student as mm -hmm. opposed to all students. When those things start to happen, that slippery slope escalates a little bit more. Mm. And what I like to do is, is ask people who have um, found themselves in a situation where they've either been accused or they have actually um, been incarcerated perhaps because of misconduct to ask them on that slippery slope is there a, a point of no return mm -hmm. is there a is there a place where you might have recognized yourself if mm -hmm. for some reason you had that ability to really thoughtfully and mindfully examine your actions and, and I, I was talking to one female uh, offender who was actually in prison mm -hmm. and when she was released I, I asked her that question and, and was there a point of no return for you? How is there a, a place where you knew that you had gone too far, hmm. and or or you even knew your step on that slippery slope? And, and her response was most interesting. She said, "Troy, have you ever heard the phrase death by a thousand cuts?" Mm -hmm. And I said, "Of course." Right. And she said, "Well, this was death by a thousand cuts, and to this day, even after being in prison, I have no idea which was the first." Really? Really? Right. Wow. And again, I think that harkens back to how gradual the slippery slope really is. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and actually how um, others will applaud a teacher for um, be, being so caring and investing into the wow. life of a singular student, not understanding and even uh, not even understanding um, that we're not maybe not trained and prepared to know how to mm -hmm. do that. And that could be a very dangerous predicament. As, as you were talking, I was thinking a school really is a team. It's not an individual. So Absolutely. so a, a big part of potentially addressing this problem is that when you feel like a conversation is getting a little bit too close, you can call in other resources in your school, right. suggest that the student talk to the guidance counselor, right. suggest that the student right. talk to the nurse, right. uh, uh, so that the conversation isn't interpersonal. It's, it could right. be a personal conversation, but it involves the whole team. Right. The more people are involved, the less likely you are to find yourself Kind and of and one of the big problems, too, is that teachers go into teaching because right. they care about students. Uh -huh. right. Right, right. And they'll tell you, what's the main thing that brings you into teaching? It's not the salary, I guarantee mm -hmm. you that. Mm -hmm. It used to be being off in the summer, and now they're not even off in the summers anymore. Right. <laughs> and so it's, it's kids. They love kids. Mm -hmm. But right. what happens in that relationship between a teacher and, and a student is, is that it so gradually goes bad in, yeah. in, in, in these cases that, that, that tragically end up in some type of, of uh, conviction or some type of, of misconduct. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things, when I was the executive director of the Standards Board in Kentucky, we had the responsibility for prosecuting these cases. Mm -hmm. And we prosecute dozens of cases every month. Uh, and one of the things that always came out was that the teacher or the witnesses would say, you know, I think I saw it. I knew something was wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. I could see it, but 
I didn't know how to talk to her or to him about it. Right. And, and that yeah. was where, actually, this is a great point at which to introduce how NASDAQ mm -hmm. makes an unmindful situation more mindful, because that's mm -hmm. what you're really about, isn't well, that right? And, and we're going to use this, and we're going to have another episode be more uh, deliberate about this. But mm -hmm. uh, in 2015, I think yeah. it was, yeah. Troy, Troy yeah. and I stood outside a conference hall, mm -hmm. and we yeah. had a conversation about the need for a model code of ethics for educators. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. uh, there was, NASDAQ is in the, uh, our membership are all 50 states, the U.S. territories, um, the Department of Defense schools. Uh, they all are members of NASDAQ so that when they take action against a certificate, mm -hmm. and that's, that action is public and, private, and, and, public and um, final, they enter it into our clearinghouse. Okay? So that, that way other states know about what happened in that state. But one of the things we began to know, we knew there was a need for mm -hmm. was, you know, the old adage, what do we do? Do we fix the holes in the bridge or do we go down river and just keep pulling people out of the water that falls in the <laughs> right, holes? Okay. Yeah. Sure. okay. Yeah. Yeah. The model code was repairing the bridge. Okay. Yeah. After 150 years mm. of public schools, you would think, and I, I would imagine if we would ask almost any parent, even m most school board members, is there a, a code of ethics for educators? They would say yes. Mm. But there never has been. There never, never. has been. Yeah. Never. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Never has been. Hmm. Codes of conduct, but not codes right. of ethics. Which is totally That's different. Great. Yeah. Completely different. A code, of, a, a, yeah, that a that code of conduct. In, in the way <laughs> I, most people relate to this. Mm -hmm. If you're going down the road and you see a red sign that says stop, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now you know what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. You don't kind of roll. You don't kind of stop. Mm -hmm. You stop. Because right. if you don't, you you break the law. And some bad things can happen. They mm -hmm. can stop you and take your license and all these kind of things. Mm -hmm. We know that. That's a code of conduct. Okay. Right. <clears throat> that has thou shalt not, and if you do, this is what will happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Many states have codes of conduct that they call codes of ethics, but they mm -hmm. really are codes of conduct. Mm -hmm. A code of ethics is the sign that most of us have seen that is yellow and has a swirly line on it mm -hmm. and we're driving along and it's telling us that there are curves coming up. Mm -hmm. Now at that point we have a whole series of decisions to make. How fast am I going? Is the road wet? Mm -hmm. What condition are mm -hmm. my tires? Oh, How good a driver right. I am? Yeah. You know, what condition is my car? There's a whole series of questions we ask ourselves automatically. Mm -hmm. That is a code of ethics. Yeah. It's an important distinction. It's a, a, a critical Excellent. distinction because right. it, 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 people have free will, including teachers. What you're really doing with the code of ethics is providing guidance on how to use free will effectively. Right. Mm -hmm. Not right. so much telling them what to do, but offering them general yeah. parameters that they can <clears throat> act inside of. And uh, I think that is a huge difference. So, so in essence, a code of conduct is about punishment. A right. code of mm -hmm. ethics is about prevention. Is it about prevention? Yeah, yeah. A code of conduct, or a, yeah, a code of conduct is also about consequences, mm -hmm. and a code of ethics is about choice. Right. Right. And and it's interesting that a code of ethics or any kind of statutory language or policy mm -hmm. is really the lowest standard of acceptable behavior. Mm -hmm. It's the lowest standard of acceptable behavior. And, and so we like to think that ethics is, that professional ethics is really a higher threshold. Mm -hmm. and, and it really takes into account all of those variables that Phil just talked about. Right. So, you know, the, the condition of the, the road, the condition of the weather, the, the tires and so on. That also eliminates the, the, the need, right versus wrong, that binary logic kind mm -hmm. of changes. Mm -hmm. Because when you're examining the road conditions, it's going to vary car sure. by car, right. driver by right. driver, situation by situation. Mm -hmm. So it's less about, is this the right thing to do, uh, uh, as opposed to, am I making the decision, am I making the right decision for the best possible choice? Uh, okay, does that kind of make sense? Absolutely, where that difference yeah. there is, it's uh, the, that latter is about preventing right. uh, 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 what could be a tragic consequence to a career or a reputation. Right, right. The former is about punishing it after the yeah. fact, and that's exactly. not what you want. It's not right. about Right. It's not about focusing on the consequences. It's about focusing on preventing the consequences from happening. Right, and and we like to when we talk about this and we talk about the the gray, murky nuance of decision making in, mm -hmm. in our profession. Um, we're, we're really trying to say that a code of ethics is about how to navigate the gray, mm -hmm. right. and and not just navigate the, the the gray, but really embrace the gray and mm -hmm. say this is right. a part of being a professional. It's a part mm -hmm. of being a professional. Yeah. Yeah. What so any, let's have a tool to be able to do that. To doctors deal with gray. it. Uh, lawyers yeah. deal with it, and teachers are no different. You know the. 
the, the American Medical Association created their code of ethics in 1847, mm. and the American Bar Association in 1908. I, I could just keep going on and on right. with the different mm -hmm. professions. So the code of ethics for educators, the model code of et ethics for educators, was was unveiled in 2015. In 2015. That's incredible. Yeah. 2015. Yeah. That is amazing. Yeah. One of the most important pro you know, pro professions. 3.3 million yeah. professionals. It's yeah. the largest, uh, largest uh, 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 yeah. professionals yeah. in the country. And, and, th and think about this notion that when Phil mentioned earlier that there is 3.3 million public school educators right. in the country mm -hmm. that started this past fall, well, that means that they only their rudder to guide their decision making would be perhaps right. personal morality, personal right. experiences. But that's 3.3 million yeah, different yeah, personal moral right. languages that are being spoken, right. and we don't have a collective professional ethics language to speak. And, and that's that, where that our will code be, of we're, ethics. We're coming up on the end of our program. This this episode has to wrap at some point. This is a good point Absolutely. at which to wrap it. Yeah. Uh, we uh, leave with the contact information. So yeah. if you could look right in the camera there, sure. uh, Troy and Phil, and tell people how to reach you. Right. Uh, Thanks very much. Troy, you you bet. Uh, my name is Troy Hutchings, and my email address would be thutchings at ets.org. Yeah. And if you'd like to look at the resources that we have, and most of them are public and free, including the Model Code of Ethics for Educators, you can go to www.nasdec.net. NASDAQ, N-A-S-D-T-E-C dot -E net. That's excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, Philip Rogers, what a pleasure. Thank Troy you. Hutchins, yeah, nice so thank you. Uh, great thank having you, you both on uh, Disruptive Thank you, TV. Al. Thank and you, Joe. Appreciate gentlemen, it. thank you. Thanks Al. to all of you for joining us for this very important episode, and uh, we hope you'll join us again for a future episode of Disrupted TV. In the meantime, I'm Al Cini. I'm still Joe S. Mendy. And we'll see you again. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Thanks very much. There you go. Great. <laughs>